Good morning, friends. As we prepare for worship, we're about ready to start our live broadcast, and the prelude will begin. So I invite you to begin your silent meditation as we prepare our hearts to draw near to the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. It's a joy to gather with you here as we've gathered to celebrate all that God has done for us and all that he is. And it's a joy that we could be here today to hear these extraordinary words in the scripture today about the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the world around us and at work through us. We're also very blessed today to have with us David Smith, who's going to be playing for us at 1030 for the next uh, few months, helping while Lindsay's on a little break. So. David, we thank you for your gift of music and, the sh and sharing your talent with us. Just a reminder, next week at this time, we'll be at Leitersburg at the Roratan Pavilion for the picnic. So we hope that all, well, John, I know you're not going to be able to make that, but it's great you're here today. So, but the rest of us, we're really glad you, hopefully you can join us next week at the Roratan Pavilion. You're not going to be able to make it either, are you? You'll be back in Pittsburgh, right? In that area. 
But you could come back. You're welcome. Thanks. Susie. So we're having a church and a yes. 10.30 church will be there. We're here at 8 o'clock. Now, if this works out like it did the last time we did this for Pentecost, we all gathered in here because people thought it would be too hot at the, at the funeral home parking lot for church. We were here for church, and the air conditioning didn't work. So it was sweltering in here. And those of us who went to the funeral home parking lot had the most delightful breeze, and we couldn't light any of the sparklers and firecrackers that we had for, the, for Pentecost because it was too breezy. So, uh, well, hopefully the Lord will refresh us next week in just the same way and give us the perfect weather for our get-together in the afternoon. There is a sign-up sheet back here in the narthex for anyone who'd like to sign up and let us know what you're bringing for the picnic. In the meantime, please stand as we begin with our opening confession found on page 116. We begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin. Receive your forgiveness and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters, let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our opening hymn is God is Here, number 526.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for the offer here, their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord our God, who makes manifest your almighty power above all things by pardoning and showing us mercy, we pray for your grace to be abundantly upon us and make all of us understand and, and, and be heirs to your promises, to your treasures of heaven through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. The first reading for today is found in Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 to 29. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp one named Eldad and the other Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to them, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. The word of the Lord. The psalm we'll be reading today is Psalm 19, verses 7 through 14. The congregation's part is in bold type. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servant pr from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. The second reading is found in James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? 
they should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. Do, do my friends at the, sitting up top, do you want to come down for a children's message today? Okay. morning. Are we all having a good day so far? Good, good. Um, this, this is not a trick question. And it's an easy question. I bet you can answer it really easy. At your house, is there somebody who's in charge? Who's in charge? Mom and your mom and dad. Parents are supposed to be in charge, right? It's not, it's not a trick question. That's just the way it's supposed to. And it's that way for a, re, a really important reason, right? Because you may not know this, but I'm going to tell you if you don't, your parents love you. Do you know that? That's why they're in charge. They're there because they love you and they want the best for you and they want to teach you all about right and wrong. And in today's gospel reading, uh, Jesus had some disciples and they were upset because somebody was doing something and he said, he's doing it in your name and he's not one of us. But Jesus said, oh, no, no. Anyone who does the right thing in my name is one of us. So it's important for us to remember as our parents love us and teach us the difference between right and wrong, they help us not only to belong to our family that we live with, but to a bigger family of God. We belong to the church. And in the church, we learn how to treat other people with love and respect. We learn how to be kind to them and how to help them when they need help. And those are all lessons that we learn at home from our parents. Hopefully, we learn how to be respectful and thoughtful, and they teach us how to speak nicely, to say things like, may I help you? And now, I'm sure at home, your parents never just bark an order, right? They, they say, oh, won't you please 
take your dishes and put them in the dishwasher. They never say, hey, put those dishes away. Do they say that? No, go oh, good. Well, I have to confess in our house, sometimes it slips out that way, doesn't it, buddy? Yeah, but the truth is we know, we know that even parents, we need to set an example and teach our children how to be polite. Teach them to say please and thank you, yes, sir, and no, sir, because the way we treat each other like that reflects how God is at work in our lives. And so it's really important for us to know that other people are watching. And when they see that we love and care for other people and we're kind to them, that Christ is at work in us. So let's pray. Gracious God, always be alive and at work in us. Help us to be kind and thoughtful to others and help us to be polite and to always share what we have with those who need it most. And we ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Okay, go back to your seats. Holy God, as we meditate upon your word, as we hear your word today and think about it and its rich meaning for us, help us to be transformed by what we hear and by what we experience so that we might share with the world all that you are and all that you long for us to be and for them as well. And we ask this in Christ's holy name. Amen. Well, first, let me begin by telling you, I'm really excited that, about this Old Testament reading from Numbers because I just love the names, Eldad and Medad. I have never in my journeys anywhere ever met any living people named Eldad or Medad. And I think to myself, what a missed opportunity. Because as I look out among you today, if I were to yell, hey, John, there's at least two people here that are going to, they're going to say, what, 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 what's going on? And if we're in a larger group, you know, we still say, hey, David, hey, Mike, hey, Joe, lots of people are going to, what, 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 Who's, who do you need? But if you were named Eldad or Medad, that would never happen. It would be as if your name was Virgil. <laughs> Generally in a crowd, if I hear my name, I know it's me. They're, they want. There aren't a whole lot of us running around. Ingrid, do you have that problem too? Yeah, see, uh, it's, it's, but it's an okay problem to have. But let's not shy away from these really important names, Eldad and Medad, because they did something extraordinary. Now, first of all, they were a little bit like some of us. They're very human. Moses, the backstory here is that there were lots of things going on and Moses needed help and, God, and he prayed and God said, select 70 of the elders and I'm going to set them apart. I'm going to let my, a portion of my spirit be given to them. And so Moses sent out these invitations, but these two guys didn't come. They were like people who should have been in church on a Sunday morning, but they chose not to show up for whatever reason. I mean, I can't imagine what would keep you but, you know, sometimes there are legitimate reasons. Let's be honest. If you have insomnia, I highly recommend that you pick up the book of Deuteronomy. Because in reading Deuteronomy at night, you will find out all the legitimate reasons for violating the Sabbath. For example, did you know? Now, some of you may know this because you've grown up around farming. You know exactly how cows are. When you're dressed and ready to go to church or a wedding or something really important, that's the exact moment they will break through the fence and have to be put back in, and you've got to mend the fence or put them in a stall somewhere until you can get back and lock them up because they, they just have this sixth sense about that. They know you're going someplace. But the book of Deuteronomy tells us if your ox or your donkey should fall into a pit, it is perfectly legitimate to, miss, observe, to, to not observe all the laws of the Sabbath to save your donkey, or your ox. So for all we know, Eldad and Medad may have been very busy saving a donkey or an ox or something and missed this opportunity. But, we, but, in, but you see, that's not what was assumed. What was assumed and what, we're, what is implied is that they were just laying out. They were just said, well, we're not going to go or we'll get there when we get there. And when they did get there, look what happened. God didn't say, oh, they didn't come when I said so, so they're cut off. Instead, God said, I'm still going to put my spirit in them. And these men prophesied, and they were witnessed. There were people there to witness the fact that these men were prophesying and that the gift was given to them. And when this assistant runs up, when Joshua run, runs up to Moses and says, look what happened. This is horrible. Moses says, no, it's not. Stop it. Be glad they're here, and let's be excited that they too have received a portion of God's Spirit. Now, this is a perfect bookend to the way Jesus starts 
the gospel reading today. When John, if you, now some of you may remember last week, what was in the reading? Well, in the reading last week, the disciples were arguing who is greatest in his, and who would be the greatest in his kingdom. So here we have it again. They didn't get it last week when Jesus tried to tell them, whoever wants to be first must be the servant of all. So John comes running in and what does he say? Oh, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Oh, we tried to stop him because he's not one of us. He's not, did you hear? he's not following us. And Jesus said, no, don't try to stop him. What are you doing that for? Jesus said, he's doing it in my name. Pay attention to what he says. He says he's doing it in my name. But these disciples who have been jockeying for power, who've been trying to find their place in the pecking order, were so unhappy because they saw someone who wasn't one of them doing the very thing that they longed to do, to cast out the demons, to do the work in these miracles that Jesus was performing in the world around them. It's really important for us to know that, it's, that we must never try to squelch, never, and that's a good word that we don't get to use, for, to, or, or, or in some way to contain the work of the Holy Spirit of God. He has this extraordinary gift of his spirit that moves among his people and transforms them in disparate places, in ways and in times that we can't fully comprehend or understand. And it's never on our timetable. And sometimes they do it in ways that we're not sure if we like it. You see, what we hear in this reading today is an echo of some places, and I'm not pointing fingers here because I don't think this happens in our church. But if you think it does, you'll understand what we need to do about it. We should never, ever try to tamp down the Holy Spirit. I want to, I'm trying to figure out a, a way to tactfully tell you a story that I said at 8 o'clock I wasn't going to tell. Because this is broadcast and we never know who's going to hear this and how they're going to take it. So I'm just going to speak in general terms. I belong to a, an organization. Um, I'm a member of a, a board somewhere. And that board received a letter from some people inside the organization who were concerned about the way things were going. And the letter was just addressed to the board. It wasn't addressed to any one person or committee or anything like that. And I took it upon myself as a relatively new member of that board to investigate what was being said in this letter, to talk to the individuals. And there were several who had signed the letter. And I went on my little fact finding and I took my notes and I came prepared for the, for a, a, I was preparing for a board meeting when I received a nasty email from the person who was in charge of that board of trustees who said to me, you shouldn't do that. We have a committee. We have a committee who takes care of those kinds of concerns. And you've inserted yourself into this organization in a way that you shouldn't have. And I can't help but be the person God created me to be. So I had a very simple response to that email. Well, it's your committee. What did you do about it? I knew the answer because I had talked with all the people who had signed the letter. And I point blank said, has anyone else spoken to you about your concerns? No, nope, nobody did. So I took it upon myself as a, as a general member of the board of trustees to take seriously this thing that was brought to my attention. But boy, were the executive members of that board upset because I did not leave it to their committee to take care of it when they felt like they'd get around to it, whatever year that may have been. And they were really upset because, you know, there's an administrator there and I should have consulted with the administrator before talking to the people who had written this letter. And when I said, well, the letter's about the administrator, that doesn't seem to jive very well. But you see, this can happen in churches too. The dangerous thing that can happen in churches sometimes is that God's working in an extraordinary way. And he starts stirring in the hearts of people to do something really wonderful in ministry. And other people will say, well, you didn't come to our committee meeting. You didn't come and ask us for permission to do that. And that's dangerous. That's so dangerous. Because if we take Jesus seriously, he says, when you do things in my name, that's what matters. And it doesn't matter who gets credit for it. It doesn't matter what your place is in the pecking order. If God is stirring in your heart to do something, you got to do it. 
And you can't stop to worry about where does it fall and who told me I could or I couldn't. You see, now, one of the reasons why I'm really excited about being the pastor in this church is that I've watched this over the last year or so. I've really watched things emerging and bubbling up to the surface. And, and sometimes people have tried to go through channels, and sometimes they were told by the people while they went through those channels, well, you know, we're, we're doing what we think we can do, but if you want to do something, you just go ahead and do it. Which is a lot better than saying, no, we're not going to do that, and don't you dare. Because, you see, it's dangerous when we assume the way we've always done it has to be the way we go about it forever. God is always at work in the world doing something new, stirring in us to do something new, to turn away from the sinful things that cling to us, to turn away from the brokenness and the hurt parts inside of us and be made well and be made whole. And he's asking us to go out and do something extraordinary, to do something wonderful. And so when I think about what happened this summer with Sunday school here in our church, that some folks got together and heard that the summer Sunday school was going to be canceled because there were no teachers and just wasn't sure that we could. They said, well, let's try something new. And they were told, if you want to try it, go ahead. Well, on its face, that was the best thing they could do because it gave those other ladies permission to be drinking in the Holy Spirit. And while they were taking all that in, they were able to give it back. And our summer Sunday school was fuller than it has been in years. And young people wanted to be here to be a part of what was going on. And now it's spilled over into regular Sunday school. And, it's, and it has the power to re-energize and revitalize that as well. I remember several years ago when we started Micah's Backpack. Someone went to a meeting, heard about Micah's Backpack, signed our church up, and then came back and said, what do I do? I went to a committee and they don't, they're not sure they can do this. I said, well, we find somebody who will. And that's exactly what we did. And that ministry still continues because at its heart, God was stirring in the hearts of people here to attend to the basic needs of little people whose parents weren't doing their jobs on the weekend and feeding them. And that's how the Holy Spirit works. And the worst thing that we can ever do as followers of Christ is to look in a judgmental way at someone else and say, well, you didn't follow the process because Jesus isn't worried about the process. He's worried about you being faithful. He's worried about you being fully committed to the power of God at work in your life and in the community around us to transform its brokenness, to call it into this beautiful vision that God has for who we can be and who we should be and who he needs us to be. Now, there's some other stuff in this gospel reading today that is really, it's a handful, let's be honest. I, I sometimes think to myself, you know, there, there are certain readings in the scripture and they're good for us to hear from time to time. They're really important. But let's be honest, if we have unchurched folks who come to sit among us for a Sunday morning and the thing that they hear is that if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. If your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. Boy. How about that for an evangelism strategy? Let's just gather up all the nasty body parts that are offending everyone, put them in a great big pile and set them on fire, and won't that be great? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. That's what we think in our own judgmental way. But what he is, he's saying something much more important to us. He's saying that even our own selves, parts of us, can really get in the way sometimes. We get caught up in ourselves. We get caught up in what we want, what we want to do, what we think we really want to do, even though we know sometimes it's nearly not what we should do. And Jesus is not telling you literally to maim yourself, but he is telling you to take seriously the call of the gospel, which requires all of our being, all of us, a total, a total commitment of who we are, being all in, for what it is that God has in store for us and understanding that it may be something so radically different than anything we've ever done before. And it may be hard and it may be challenging, but a life in faith following Christ is so worth it because in the end and also for most of the journey, 
we stretch and grow and we find out who God really made us to be and what we are made of. Because you see, those things that cause us to stumble are oftentimes our excuses. They're the things that we throw out there. Oh, I can't do that because of... But God's not interested in your excuses. He already knows them. He knows you. He knows what it's, what's, what's at work inside of you. He who gave up his son on the cross, who stretched out his arms and gave up his life for you and I to be made truly alive, understands that there is human weakness in each and every one of us. And he understands that's exactly why we need God's mercy. That's why we need his grace. It's why we need his son. And he says to us, don't, don't tamp down or squelch my spirit at work in your world. Now, if I were a good Calvinist, I would now give you a good diatribe on the sovereignty of God. I would tell you how all of this is rooted in the sovereignty of God. And it is. But what does that mean, the sovereignty of God? Well, let's be honest. Let's break it down into terms you and I can easily understand. God is in charge, and he doesn't need our permission. That's what it means. And we frequently think that God should do things the way we think he should do things. We think that the world would be a better place if God would see things the way we see things. But frequently, we can't see the bigger picture of what it is that God is really up to. And understand there's so many more moving parts to the things that we experience and go through. And so what do we do? We look with judgment on ourselves, on our peers, on the people around us. We figure that people are probably just goofing off or not doing what they're supposed to. They're just being selfish. But we don't know that. The truth is, maybe they're doing things that are of value to them. Maybe they're doing things that have value to God that we don't fully appreciate. But letting God be in charge is the most important thing that you and I can do each and every day of our lives. Letting God be who he is, letting his Holy Spirit be stirring in our hearts and drawing us out from ourselves to be alive for the world around us is so much more important than building a wall and closing ourselves off as we look at everyone else through judgmental eyes. Jesus is quite emphatic. Whoever does these things in my name, because they have heard me speak, whether they go through the proper channels, doesn't really matter. What matters most is that they do it for God. And that's the question that you and I will have to struggle with throughout the rest of this week. Are we approaching our day looking for what it is that God needs us to do? what it is that his Holy Spirit stirs our hearts to care about, to be passionate about? Or are we just cutting ourselves off, sitting on our own little chair, in our own little corner somewhere, creating a kingdom for ourselves, and wondering why other people can't quite ascertain our good judgment and why we should do the things the way we think? Don't cut yourself off. Be open to the power of the Holy Spirit, alive in you, be open to the power of the Holy Spirit in the world outside this door where God needs every L dead and me dead and you. God needs you to be attuned, to be listening, to be paying attention, to be looking for opportunities. And it doesn't just happen in one place. One of the most fascinating things that I heard several years ago from a clergy colleague, he was talking with he, he was recounting a conversation he had with, um, the, with someone who belonged to one of these large non-denominational churches that have remote locations. So literally, you go to the church and you watch the praise, the praise band might be there or they show you the whole thing on TV for like 45 minutes. And then the, then the preacher is also on TV for another 45 minutes. And then they say some prayers and they have some more songs and you go home. But they do this in remote locations. So, because they're too big to gather in any one place. And, and he, this, this Lutheran colleague of mine said he listened intently while this man was telling him how wonderful this was. And he said, well, you know, that's a concept that we've been employing since before the nation was founded. If you look around, every community has its own little Lutheran church. And the difference is we have a slightly larger staff. We try to put people in there to preach in person every Sunday. Imagine that. And... That has colored the way I look at the church 
ever since he talked to me about that. Because you see, sometimes even among clergy, we get wrapped, they get wrapped up in what John says, and they think that somehow church is some kind of competition. They think that the more people you have sitting in your pew under your name on a Sunday morning means something about you, but it doesn't. It reflects Jesus. It doesn't reflect me. And so just this week when someone came to me and said, Pastor, we've been away for a while and we're not sure we're coming back. And we might be going to this other place. I shared a story that I, of, a, of a bishop of the Virginia Synod who I knew 12 years ago. A church was very upset, a congregation, and they said, we want to disassociate from the Virginia Synod and the ELCA in general. And Bishop Monty put his arm around the church council president and he said, my friend, I'm sorry to hear that, but you will always be my brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you believe walking away from us is important for you on your journey of faith, I'm not going to fight you over that. I'm only going to tell you the door is always open. If you go on this journey and you find it's not working and you're struggling, please give me a call. Our door is always open and you will always be welcomed back. That was some incredible grace extended to people because that is not the story that I have encountered in other places when churches get upset and want to disassociate. In the same way, I told that story to this person I was talking to this past week as I put my arm around her and said, if you believe it's better for you and your journey of faith to be somewhere else, then my dear, I can't possibly stand in your way. But please always know, our door is open, our arms are open, and you will be welcomed back if, that, if, we're, if your new journey doesn't work out. Because you see, this is not a competition either. This is all of us listening to the Holy Spirit and trying to draw near to Jesus and trying to live each day in the shadow of the cross and looking at the world through that lens. And whether people walk around and say, oh yes, I belong to Pastor Kane's church or I belong to um, Pastor Reed's church or Pastor Julie's church, it doesn't matter. I don't have a church. Jesus has a church. I'm just an administrator here. I'm just middle management at best, but we all belong to Christ and we must always be listening to Christ and listening for the Holy Spirit to speak to us and remind us whose we are and what he created us for. And then we need to be bold and not be afraid to live out the ministry that he brings to us and to embrace it each and every day. Amen. Our hymn of the day is number 865, Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven.
Let us join in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our prayer intercessor today is Pastor Hembrock, and we're very pleased um, to have you pray. If, you, if you'll allow me, I'm going to go ahead and pray over these requests that we received outside during our coffee and social hour. But yes. no. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the concerns brought to us and lifted up, written on these prayer cards today. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to stir among those who share these concerns and those whom they affect. May your goodness, your mercy your healing, be at work in whatever has been lifted up to you in these prayers. May you hear the prayers of your people, and may your will be done. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of all things, with gladness we give thanks for all your goodness toward us. We bless you for the love which has created and which sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, through whom you have made known your will and grace. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and good people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you, our Lord, has done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness by lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We ask you to save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ our Savior. Give it pastors and ministers filled with your spirit and strengthen it through the word and the holy sacraments. Make it perfect in love in all good works and establish it in the faith delivered to the saints. Sanctify and unite your people in all the world with one holy church that will bear witness to you, the creator, the redeemer of all. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Give your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and to those who hold office in your church that by their faithful service, and your, and your strength to them, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to labor in the gospel, both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And in your mercy, O Lord, strengthen those new to the faith. Support them in times of trial. Keep them steadfast and make them steadfast, abounding in the work of your, that you have for them. And let their faith and zeal for the gospel refresh and renew the witness of your people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life of integrity. Grant health and favor to all who have been elected to lead this land giving them the strength and courage needed to govern justly and help them to serve this nation according to your holy will. And we pray especially this day for first responders and those who have been chosen to protect us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us that spirit of love, O Christ, that you shared with us, and dispose our days in your peace. Prosper the labors of those who take counsel for the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and 
common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Bless, this, bless the Sunday schools, the public schools, the colleges, the universities, and centers of research, and those who teach in them. Bestow your wisdom in such a measure that teachers and students may serve you in church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the rule of your truth and your justice and your wisdom. Excuse me why I change pages, Lord. Sanctify our homes with your presence and your joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptisms and enable their parents to rear them in a life of faith and devotion. And by the spirit of affection and service, unite the members of all families that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Let your blessing rest upon the seed time and the harvest, the commerce and the industry, the leisure and the rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and be with all who lay their hands to any useful task. Give them just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is good in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Comfort with grace of your Holy Spirit all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity, especially those we name this, at this time out loud or in the depths of our hearts. For Richard, for Joyce, for Wayne, for Valerie, for Bonnie, for Donnie, for Georgia. Yes. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow or mourning. And to all, grant a measure of your love taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you in your church on earth, who now rest from their labors, especially those most dear to us, whom we name in our harps always in our prayers. Keep us in fellowship with all of your saints and bring us at last to the joy of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord, we give thanks that we have in our presence John, home from Afghanistan, safe and, and uh, having grown and learned uh, so much, being tested there in the skills that he has. We just give thanks and rejoice. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, Grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, who now lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit and lives in our hearts, one God forever. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, as he says to us, My peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, my brothers and sisters. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us offer to another sign of God's peace.
Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth food from the earth and you nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts toward those who hunger in any way that all may know your care. And prepare us now to feast on the bread of life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy. That we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Oh. God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, endless is your mercy and eternal your reign. You have filled all of creation with light and life, and heaven and earth are filled with your glory. We give you praise for the grace shown to your people in every age, the promise to Israel, the rescue from Egypt, the gift of the promised land to your chosen ones, the words of the prophets, and at this, the end of all the ages, the gift of your Son, who proclaimed the good news in word and deed and was obedient to your will even to giving his life. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ will come again. again. Therefore, O oh God, with this bread and cup, we remember the life that our Lord Jesus offered for us. And believing the witness of his resurrection, we await his coming in power to share with us the great and promised feast. Send now, we pray, your Holy Spirit, that we who share in Christ's body and blood may live to the praise of your glory and receive our inheritance with all your saints in light. Join our prayers with those of your servants of every time and every place, and unite them with the ceaseless petitions of our great high priest until he comes as victorious Lord of all. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. My friends, I invite you to join the prayer the Lord taught us when he said, Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, Happy are those called to his supper. You may be seated.
and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and bring you to everlasting life. Amen. And let us pray. O Lord, may this heavenly mystery restore in us, both in mind and body, so that we may be co-heirs in glory with Christ, to whose suffering we are united whenever we proclaim his death, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We are charged with a mission. I'm going to invite you to be seated for just a moment because there are several announcements. <laughs> Marilyn, would you like to go first? for this church. Uh, the cornerstone of the first church was laid on May 27th of 1822. So we're shooting for some time around that date for our special finale, but we want to do things, several things to celebrate throughout the year and throughout the early part of the year. So this requires a lot of planning and a lot of, of uh, involvement of members of the congregation. We're having a meeting tomorrow evening at seven o'clock in the upstairs Sunday school room to continue working on some of the plans we came up at our initial session. And we invite any and all of you to come and help because we will need a lot of hands to make quick work. Thank you. Just a reminder again, next week is the picnic and we will not be here at 1030. We will be there at 1030 and the there is down the road at the Leitersburg Ruritan. We pray that you will all be able to join us. There will be a luncheon to follow. If you'd like to write down the side dish you're bringing, that's on the side. Is that not on your sign up sheet? Oh, okay. Well, I'm really glad. The people at 8 o'clock are so kind. Do you know, after I told them all there was a sign-up sheet, not one person said, oh, Pastor, you didn't get that right. There's no sign-up sheet. <laughs> so it's electronic. Yeah. What about people who don't, don't do that? Okay. Please see my wife after church if you don't do the Facebook or the electronic thing. Um, just come like a flash mob and start singing something. <laughs> That'd be fun. <laughs> We've got to make life interesting. My gosh, who wants just people to walk up to you quietly and say, I want to bring macaroni salad. Have some pizzazz. So, any other important announcements to be shared for the good of the order? Yes, ma'am. Would you like So, any donations for the shoebox ministry operation Christmas child, it'd be nice to have all those items next week, right? So we can make a full inventory and see what we're lacking, okay? Any, does anyone else have something to share? I would remind you that today is the Steam and Craft Festival, although you wouldn't know it because everybody could find a parking place easily on our parking lot without requiring attendance today. So that was kind of nice, but maybe next year it'll be back in Smithsburg, who knows? Um, that would be nice too. Uh, but please feel free to go down to Sharpsburg now the church is over and you can buy lots of water because y'all look really thirsty. And again, thank you, David, for leading us today from the organ. Thank you, choir. Please stand and receive this blessing. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord look upon you with his mercy and fill you with his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn today, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Five, four, five.
the peace of Christ.